Hello. Oh, wow, this thing is on. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Yeah? Um, my name is Dean, and as Phil said, I work at Google. And I find where the slow parts of the code are and tell someone about it. Uh, <laughs> so, <it's laughs> well, sometimes I fix them too, you know, don't tell anyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on for the past mm, year or so. Uh, it's an open source re-implementation of a tool we built at Google that uh, we call X-Ray. So who among the people in the room have heard of X-Ray? Yay! Have you heard of it from me? <laughs> okay, all right, well, just making sure. Um, so I gave a talk in the C++ meetup in Sydney a couple weeks back, which is the beta version of this talk. And then last week I gave a talk about this a bit more detail into how it works and stuff at the LVM developer meeting. That will be on the YouTubes, but this one is a talk I'm giving to you today, so this is special. <laughs> um, no, so there's, there's a bit more content here than there was last week and the week before. So that's a long way of saying this is an active project. So today I'm going to talk about X-Ray in the LVM project. If you were here earlier in the day, uh, Chandler talked about using LVM for all your C++ stuff because it's awesome and amazing. Um, one of the things that's in LVM is this function called tracing system. So who among us have tried to debug our slow stuff in C++? Try is the operative word. Who succeeded? Well done. All right. All right. Um, did you use X-Ray? <laughs> no. All right. So uh, this talk, we're going to cover what X-Ray is, how X-Ray does its thing, and how you use it, and when you can expect certain things from the project. All right. So we're going to go through things like, you know, what is X-Ray? How do you use X-Ray? Um, how, how does X-Ray do what it does? And, you know, what to expect next. So before we, anything else, we need to talk about why. Uh, why X-Ray exists and, you know, um, why everyone tries to debug their C++ latency and, you know, some of us succeed. And, you know, why that's so hard. So in, in the beginning, there was stuff. Uh, you, can, you can today use tools that allow you to sample the execution trace of your program and then figure out, well, on average, what is actually running on my CPU? So you wrote some code, you built some stuff, you put it in production, and then you take samples every 10 milliseconds, and then you, know, you, you do some math in your head or statistics if you believe there are different things. Um, so, and you say, well, okay, you know, of, of my 1,000 samples in the number of times I sampled in this period of time, this thing was on the stack, or like this is the stack trace. And so you reason, yeah, maybe that's the thing that's causing my stuff to be slow, because, you know, it's showing up, right? We don't know, like average, on the average case, yeah. Sometimes, though, it's not the average you want to debug. Sometimes it's something that happens in one out of a thousand uh, operations you're doing per second. Or sometimes more rare than that, if you have a high throughput, high latency, or low latency, sorry, don't want high latency. So high throughput, low latency system, you kind of want to figure out what the distribution of latencies are for your stuff. And, you know, we, we at Google have like really large systems that we write in C++ and we serve like search queries among other things. And it's, it's really hard to find where the latency is coming from unless you do some of the things that you would normally do, like insert printf statements in places and say at this time, this thing happened. And then now you have gigabytes of traces or you know, of logs and you, know, you get to dive into them. Um, the other thing is doing these manual, inserting your own logging at places is very error prone and very misleading. And sometimes it will skew your measurements because the logging is not free and the logging is not cheap. So it'd be great if it was cheap enough that you can just turn it on, right? And then just collect data and then analyze it after the fact. Except we don't know a lot of these tools that make it you know, easy to do. And so at Google, we, we worked on a thing called X-Ray. And initially, X-Ray was implemented on top of patches in GCC. We have those patches. 
out in the open as well, but not integrated into the main line uh, for GCC. So we said, well, you know, this LVM thing is pretty nice. Why don't we, you know, just make it open source and part of LVM? And so a lot of people nodded when they heard that, and they thought I was joking. So I'm like, hey, well, Chandler was one. It's like, sure, wink. Uh, <laughs> Then, you know, a year and a half after that initial, no, really, I meant it, we have X-Ray as open source. So some, some high-level features for X-Ray is, first one in that list of bullets is it leverages compiler knowledge of code structure. So it knows where your functions are, where they start, and where they end. And so we put interesting instrumentation points in these places so that we can do some interesting things later. Uh, the second bullet point is also important. We want the instrumentation points to be cheap, if not free, right? So that requirement is there because we want to be able to deploy stuff in production that have these instrumentation points and then be able to turn it on when we need to get traces, turn it off, and it looks like nothing happened, right? So having the instrumentation points cheap enough that you can deploy your stuff in production with it and then be able to dynamically turn it on and off, the tracing system, and then gather the data and then analyze it to your heart's content offline. Right? So, who has stuff in production? Do you want to get your traces from production? <laughs> of course everyone does, right? <laughs> so, the other thing about like load testing environments, right? And you know, like dev cells, or dev clusters, they're great when you're developing and actively developing, but once you've deployed stuff in production, you might see like interesting scenarios where you didn't plan for while you're developing and testing, right? And so being able to deploy in production and get the traces is really, really key for a lot of people that care about the performance of their systems. And because it's a C++ conference, let's assume everyone here cares about performance, which may not be a safe assumption. I'm just, I'm just saying. Or it may be. Um, so what is X-Ray? Now, we're not going to talk about this X-Ray. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice picture, um, but that's not the X-Ray we're going to talk about. So X-Ray is compiler-inserted instrumentation in functions. Big words, it's basically the compiler putting stuff in places where you shouldn't be able to notice it's there. And it's also a runtime library that you can turn on and off dynamically. And it's a collection of tools that allow you to get these traces that you get from these systems and analyze them offline. Yes? Yes. All right, so we're going we're gonna to talk about one piece of this first. We're going to talk about no ops in the right places. So has anybody heard of the term nopsleds? Come on, don't be shy. You've heard of that. All right. I bet you haven't heard of it in like good company. So um, nops in, for example, x86-64 are instructions that do nothing. They're there because reasons um, for alignment actually so so the the system like because x86 doesn't have like fixed size instructions they have instructions that a lot that do nothing and allow you to pad your your text section so that you can align the addresses of labels and basic blocks of your program to nice 16 byte 8 byte boundaries and the compiler does this for sometimes good reason to you know make the make the cpu happy with the code it's giving uh the system and also <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh and also for um predictability some systems don't predict uh, don't don't perform well when you know certain parts of the code aren't aligned properly so some compiler writers thought you know it's a good idea to be able to do this and so it's there. So no ops, when the, when, the, when the processor hits a no op operation, it basically does nothing. And it's called a sled because you can jump to one of these instructions. And if there's a sequence of those, the, the instruction, the, 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 the CPU will just slide through 
It's like it jumped into a sled and then it skid through to the next instruction that's not a knob. So we're putting these knobs in the right places, right? So we call them sleds, knob sleds, and we want those to be in places that would be beneficial to rewrite at runtime. So before you freak out, <laughs> you may have heard of programs that do this for nefarious reasons. Now, please suspend this belief. We're not doing anything nefarious. Just, just weird. Um, so we want this to be overwritable at runtime. And so the way we do this is we get the cooperation of the compiler, and we know where the start of a function is and where the multiple exits it may have are, right? So we also put them in the places where we care. So entries and exits, and sometimes there are, there are places where you want to say there's an event that happened here, so we have custom event sleds, right? And then we put them on interesting functions. You typically don't want to instrument all the functions in your binary because that's just going to introduce bloat. Even if these instrumentation points are cheap, they are not free. And the disks, they are not free either. So choosing which functions to instrument is key to getting enough fidelity to be able to start reasoning about what is actually happening in your program. Right? OK, so we pick interesting functions by some heuristics. One of them is, does your function, at the point it's at which it's being lowered into machine code, does it still have a loop? If it does, then we instrument that function because we assume a function that has loops might have vari you know, varied execution time because the input might cause the loop to run longer or shorter. And then we also look at functions that have more than 200 instructions. So 200 is an arbitrary number. I'm just going to say that out loud. But it's a nice round number, except not a power of 2. So that might be a bug. Uh, <laughs> Right. And then we want to also be able to mark functions that we actually want to be instrumented. So for example, you might have a piece of your code that's not exactly, doesn't have exactly a loop and isn't really long enough to be instrumented by the heuristics, but it marks a phase, for example, in your program. And you want to be able to see, well, actually, I entered this function and then it may call other functions. So you want to be able to maybe see that. So you can mark them using attributes in C++ and C, and Objective-C, and Objective-C++. Yeah? So anything in Clang that supports this attribute syntax, um, you can use it. So let's see an example, right? Uh, everybody read C++, yes? All right. That's a great thing with C++ conferences. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to show some code and some assembly. x86, 64 assembly. So raise your hand if you are not comfortable with assembly. Don't be shy. OK, that's fine. All right, we're going we're gonna to go through this. We have time, which is a luxury. So can everybody read that? No. OK, it's not important what it says. <laughs> It's basically our favorite function, foo, that calls printf, like a nice C slash C++ function, and it says, hello, x-ray, in there. Nothing special, except for that thing. Um, that is an explicit annotation, an attribute in C++11 syntax that says, always instrument this function. So compiler, if you're listening, if you're out there, instrument this function. And then we call. We pass this code through Clang, and we use that dash f x-ray instrument flag. That's it. Magic is done. It will create assembly, and you know we're fine. Yeah, we're instrumenting stuff. Now, this is x86 64 assembly in not so high resolution font, but this is the entry sled. So. If you've seen any, some of these before, there's the start of the function up at the top. It says underscore Z3 foo V. Hey, I, say, I said Z. Um, <laughs> and then there's a, there's a label called x-ray sled zero, 
which is just arbitrary numbering. And there's this funny ASCII data in my text section. Is, is that fine? Yeah, so who can read like ASCII that turns into hex and turns into x86? Nobody. So that instruction is a jump across nine bytes. Like when you go home and watch the YouTubes, you can, you can try and turn that ASCII into like hex and then binary if you really want to hurt yourself. And yes, it's jump across nine bytes. So, okay, we jump across nine bytes and we have a knob or a, a multi-byte knob that is nine bytes wide. I'm sure everyone who's seen that before is like, yeah, of course, this is what you do. No. Um, so this is an instrumentation point that X-Ray added for us when we built this function. And this is for the entry. And we want to also instrument the exit. And so we have an exit sled. And this exit sled puts knobs after the ret. Pop quiz, will this ever get executed? The knobs, they shouldn't be, right? Okay, so we're putting it after the knobs and it's a 10 byte knob. If you squint and maybe pretend you understand what this means, yeah? So this is a 10 byte knob after a one byte ret. So we have 11 bytes. Hmm, both of them are 11 bytes. So it's also a arbitrary number. No, it's okay. <laughs> we measured and 11 is the nice number where we couldn't tell whether we're affecting too many things or not. And also because it will be clear later what we're overriding this with at runtime that requires 11 bytes. So if you happen to be someone who works on a compiler that targets LLVM, I'm gonna blitz through this. If you, if you compile the program with Clang and wanna see the LLVM IR, this is what it would look like more or less. There are attributes associated with this function. And that one that says function instrument x-ray always is the thing that tells the LLVM back end that you should put instrumentation points in this function. So for example, you have your own programming language and you're using C++ to play with the LLVM API, add these magic attributes and LLVM will generate the knob sleds for you. Not only will it generate the knob sleds for you, it will also put it in a nice convenient map that is in the binary. Because what use are the knob sleds and the instrumentation points if I can't tell where they are, right? Like, I'm not sure if a compiler or some other module will spell the same jump across nine bytes and then I can't assume that that is actually an X-ray instrumentation point. Right, so we need a map. We need a map to tell us where the sleds are, what kind of sleds they are. So are, are they an entry sled or are they an exit sled? Or is it a tail exit sled? Is it a custom event, et cetera, et cetera. We also keep track of those in the object file. So for example, you have a large C++ project. You compile smaller .o files, like object files. And this section, this, this instrumentation map lives along each of these object files so that when we link them together, we can figure out where in the final binary the sleds are, right? We also know whether to always or never instrument. So at runtime, we can make certain decisions about, you know, did, was this explicitly marked as always instrument or was this one of those heuristically defined functions that we're instrumenting? And we wanna keep some bytes in the instrumentation map for future extension. So we're designing this for future or forward compatibility in case we have things we wanna add in X-Ray or the community wants to add in X-Ray, we have enough bytes in there. Like 14 should be enough for everyone, right? <laughs> Famous last words. Um, they are concatenated to the, together by the linker, if I can speak correctly. So the linker knows nothing about x-ray, it's not special, it's just one of these things it will link together. So major linkers are fine usually with what we're doing here. So what does this instrumentation map look like? Time for more assembly because 
reasons. All right, so let's start with what is it called? It's called an X-ray instrumentation map. X-ray instrument map. And we have data in this map, right? So we have the address of the sled. Yeah, so that's how you spell, like, the, put the bytes for, the, uh, for that sled, the, for that label, and the compiler will put a relocation there so that it can link and figure out at link time what the actual address is of that sled. Also tells us the address of the function and what kind of sled it is. And so this one is for our function foo, which should always be instrumented. So the first byte, so byte zero says it's an entry sled, byte one says it's always instrumented, and we have the 14 bytes for reserve information. And that's the exit sled, similar information, yeah? Okay, this is just data now, this is not code. So it lives in a separate section, and the X-ray runtime then knows how to read this map and figure out what to do for each of the sleds. So now we have the instrumentation points, and now we have a map, right? What are we missing? Goggles, no. Um, we're gonna talk about the runtime library. Why did I say goggles? I don't know. Okay, um, so there's the compiler bits which are in Clang and LVM in the back end. And then there are the runtime bits that are in Compiler RT. So there's a project in LVM called Compiler RT, which Chandler showed in the keynote how to build. And part of that is a library that gets linked in to your binary at the end, which knows how to do the X-ray thing, right? So. One of the things X-Ray will do at runtime is patch and unpatch your program while it's running without stopping your threads and still be correct. No, no, for reals. Okay, so first thing it does is it goes through the instrumentation map. So we have this 32-byte data structure in memory that you know, we can treat as an array because the linker helpfully Gives, gave us the extents of this is the start of your section and this is the end of your section. The linker knows how to do this helpfully because we named the section a valid C identifier. So it's, it's weird black magic, but linker helpfully does it for us. So we, start, we have the start and the end of that array in memory and we treat each entry as 32 bytes and we play games to figure out, hey, are you an entry sled? Oh, okay, I, was, I must do this. If you are an exit sled, this is the other thing I do, right? So the next thing it does is it computes a function ID, right? So function IDs are just 32-bit identifiers to allow us to say, well, there's a function in this program, and we, gi we give it a shorter ID than the address of that function, because the address of a function, say in x86-64, is eight bytes, 64 bits, if I do my math correctly. Um, and the 32 bits is basically 50% of the 60, that's correct, right? Okay, suck at math. So, so we compute this function ID, and we figure out how far the trampolines are. So we have a trampoline, Okay, this is, this is starting to sound like a nefarious talk, but please still suspend this plea. So we have, a, we have a couple of trampolines that we hand write to stash the state of the processor, like all the registers, some, some important registers, and then call an instrumentation function that a user has installed. We're gonna get to that later. But these trampolines have a fixed address in memory when you run the program. And so we're gonna compute the relative offset from the sled to one of these trampolines. And we're gonna hope that it's within 32 bits. And if it's not, we give up. Actually, we just do. But, so for entry sleds, we wanna turn the jump across nine bytes, right, which is 11 bytes in total, to this sequence, we wanna put the function ID into a scratch register, and then we wanna call the trampoline. 
So we are intercepting the entry of a function by calling another function. This is totally fine. And then for the exits, we do a slightly different thing. We put the function ID to a scratch register, and then we jump to a trampoline. Right? We do that because that trampoline for the exit will have a return, and the return instruction will bring us to the caller of this function that we have instrumented. Right? Because that's totally what you do, right? When you have, you know, self-modifying code. So visually, right, if you disassemble the foo function we had, and I said this before, I think that's an awesome band name. You know, if you have a band, you should call yourselves foo function. Nobody's done that before. <laughs> so we want to turn the jump across nine bytes and the knobs, and this return and the knobs into these. Move number to R10D, call, and then at the bottom, move number to R10D and jump. Okay. This is fine, right? So what if you had threads? And some of those threads were, you know, running this function. And while you were writing this stuff, what happens? Well, okay, so I actually don't have slides for this, but I, I want to explain how this happens uh, as clearly as I can. We have 11 bytes, right? And this sequence of instructions, move and then call, is exactly 11 bytes. Now, right, so jump. So let's look at the offsets. That's plus 11, right? And so, 11 bytes, and then in the, se the second slide, it's still plus 11, it's still 11 bytes. Okay, so the first instruction, move R10D is six bytes, right? And then the next instruction is five bytes. So in x86-64, our cache lines are how big? 64 bytes, I think evenly sized, right? And so you can't write across two cache lines atomically. It's just either inefficient or impossible, right? Pick one of the two. So what we do is we ensure that the address of the jump instruction, which is two bytes, is, a, is at an even boundary. That way, that jump instruction, that two byte jump instruction, does not straddle a cache line, right? Now, we can't just overwrite two cache lines without thinking too much about it, right? I mean, we could, but then that might not work as we want it to. So what we do first is we write the call instruction first, the final five bytes, right? So we write the final five bytes first. It may be in another cache line. It may be in the same cache line. Doesn't really matter. But then if we, if we write that, because we have a jump, the other threads that see this write don't actually get to execute the call yet. Right? So the jump across nops, and even if we're not executing the nops, we're overwriting the nops. So the five bytes are written, but then we just can't write over the, the, the jump and the nops after it, or partial nop after it, because that write might not be uh, atomically possible because maybe the, the, the next four bytes are in a different cache line. So what we do is we write the move instruction, the partial move instruction, which is an illegal instruction. We write that first, the first the, those second four bytes, or the, the second part of the move instruction, before we write over the jump instruction. It has to be in that specific order, otherwise we're gonna have fun and games with multi-threading. So remember how I said we don't need to stop the threads? This is how we do it, all right? So at runtime, your threads are all running full speed and then we are overriding stuff in this three-step dance. Yes, sir. Sorry, 
Ah, right. Okay, so the question is, do we actually know that R10 is safe to use at these places, right? Or how do we know? Well, so we did a little bit of digging and in the, in the ABI for uh, like, like Linux and for, run, for the Intel manual, it says there are no guarantees what the state of R10 is when you enter a function and when you exit a function. It's like they made this exactly for this purpose. <laughs> Good question, sir. Thank you. You get a sticker somewhere. <laughs> All right. OK, so this, it's all downhill from here. So now if you, <laughs> if you have questions about this, yes? Right. Okay. Requires blocking interrupts or doing crazy things, erasing, erasing pages or whatever. Right. So the question is, how does this work for places for systems where we can't do this runtime rewriting of stuff? And the answer is, this is x86, 64. It does work in some of these places, but they're not as clever as this. Or, I don't know if it's clever. It's not as dangerous as this. <laughs> Let's say that. Right, so so there are there are like architectures like ARM where the the memory model is a bit more relaxed, or PowerPC where the memory model is a bit more relaxed. We play different games there, They're not as sophisticated as this runtime patching thing with x86. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So we can talk offline about you know how how crazy microcontroller environments are and how we can use this to debug our stuff. It's it's probably possible, but it won't be exactly the same way we're doing it. Fair? Cool. All right, yes? Are there any uh, performance implications just from the NOF sleds? Ah, are there performance implications just from the NOF sleds? The short answer to that is there's always a performance implication for anything. So, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, that was not deserved. But, <laughs> but, so, it changes the alignment of stuff, right? Just, just making your functions bigger will have effects on the amount of code you have in your iCache, the number of times your decoder has to work just to do the normal case, right? But so far, based on our extensive testing of this and measurement, there are cases where definitely it is affected within some measurement, um, within some uh, standard deviation, right? Where, where you start caring about differences. And there are cases where we make things faster. So, the advice there is measure, right? And make sure you can run your benchmarks with this and figure out whether actually it affects the metrics you care about. But for the stuff we've been doing in Google, most of the time we can't tell. Yes, sir. Ah, question about the security of things that have knob sleds in there. Um, I'm not a security expert. <laughs> I just measure the latency of stuff. But I'm sure there are many ways this could be exploited. I'm not smart enough to figure out how that is. But they're already in your process space. So you already probably lost. <laughs> I'm just saying. But yes, we should, uh, we should talk with more security people and figure that out. But we're, we're saying this out in the open so that either don't exploit this, please, <laughs> <laughs> or you know, more people look at it and you know, see, hey, we can do better. Okay. So one of, the, one, of the, sorry, the, one of the suggestions was, instead of NOPs, we can just use trap instructions. That's certainly a thing. And because this is open source, patches are welcome. Yeah? All right. OK, one last question before we guess. Yes. Hmm. So, because the entry sleds and exit sleds don't change address at runtime, we could pre. Well, every time you send a kernel off, you sort of patch the instructions. Ah, no, no. So, so just patch less every time. right. Yes. Um, 
Can we patch less every time we turn it on and off? Maybe we could, but it, it functionally, you, you shouldn't be able to tell whether we're writing more or less. Right? So we made the trade-off that you know, this is simple. We don't, like, you look at this and it does exactly what it does every time we're patching and unpatching. So by the way, when we're unpatching, we don't try to write back the knobs. We just write the two bytes that say jump across nine bytes because we can't be sure that no other threads are stopped in, 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 within this nine bytes, right? So we're certainly writing less when we're unpatching. But when we're patching, we can't be sure that it's already been patched and like, yeah? Okay, so moving on, yes? Yeah? So this is, I said downhill from here. Okay, so what do we want to do when we have these you know, instrumentation points? Well, we want to, we want to do something useful, right? Usually, most of the time I just compile things. But provided logging functions get called from the trampoline. So let's say we want to get the timestamp, the CPU ID, and the thread ID, and the function ID, and write like a nice little record in some in-memory buffer that's really cheap to write to, right? If we want to do that at the start of a function and say, yep, it was entered at this point, and then at the exit, we do the same and say it was exited, right? So the default implementation uses timestamp counters. So you do RDTSCP in x86-64 to get both the CPU ID and, and the timestamp and the thread and then whether you entered or exit. So there's one implementation that just writes 32 bytes. We do not care how many bytes we write, just 32 all the time with this data. There's another implementation where we're smarter about using deltas instead and compressing some of the records. But in general, we want to know when a function was entered and exited, right? And then we can reconstruct this call stack of instrumented x-ray functions offline. <coughs> we can say, well, we entered function one and then entered function two and then entered function three, and then exit three, exit two, exit one, and these are the timestamps. That gives us a call stack, right? And we can, we can do the math to figure out what the differences were, and we can figure out how long things took at function level granularity, right? Okay. Any questions so far for this? So I promise you there will be demos later. So we'll see what we can actually do. So you can customize this. If you don't need the timestamps or if you don't want to reconstruct call stacks, you can install your own handler. So you can set handler, you can remove handler. You want, if you want to get the first argument of a function because say it's a member function, you want to get the this pointer and oh, I don't know, correlate when a lock was held and when a lock was not held by which thread so that you can do contention analysis, it's a thing. Wow, yes, thank you, Mac. Guess it is 15 hours. So, <laughs> analysis tools, right? So we get this data, and then what do we do with it, right? Because data is only as good as you know, the analysis you do with it. I guess someone smarter than me or more famous already said that, but don't quote me there, please. Um, but statistics and reconstruction, right? So the thing you might want to know is, where did the time actually go? Like a simple... Of all the functions that were called in my program, how many times were they called, and what was the cumulative amount of time, and for every record you got, like what is the distribution, right? You can do a call graph with latency distributions and say, okay, well, this function called that function, and the 99th percentile of the latencies was blah, and that's a label in the edge, or interesting things like that. You can also get the latency sums and counts along the call stack. So for example, A called B called C was called, like, like that stack showed up a thousand times and now you can play games with the average and the, you know, the mean, like they're the same, right? Mean and average, yeah. The, the not average, median, 99 percentile, 99.9, max, right? So you can do funny things with that. So, right, how do you use this today? Just a quick detour, get the top of, top, God, uh, top of trunk, Clang LVM compiler RT, if you want a reference on how to do this, 
in a live programming environment, look at Chandler's talk on the YouTubes. And top of trunk, LVM, uh, if you want to use if you want to use the attributes, they're already, they've been there for a long time now. So if you have your own programming language, you want to turn on X-Ray for that, use the attributes in LVM IR. And this is currently available for Linux running on x86, 64, ARM 7, ARM 8, no thumb, 64-bit ARM, PowerPC, little NDN, and MIPS, like all the variants of MIPS in LVM. If your platform isn't here, let's make it happen in LVM, yeah? Okay, there's documentation. We, we released a white paper earlier last year, this year? Can't remember now, but there's a white paper up there. If you wanna cite references, if you're doing research or anything about that, it's publicly available. We have documentation, the LVM project, and we have a example of how to debug with X-ray. So after this talk, you can go look at these links and read through this stuff. But I'm going to show some demos, all right? Wish me luck. So, hello X-Ray. Let's say we have this, fun this, this nice, I don't know about nice, this C++ <coughs> listing, code listing. So I've highlighted in magenta the attributes, right? So the first one, function foo, we're using C out, because you know, C++. And the second one is bar, and we wanna get the first argument of bar. Right? And then we instrument main as well. So main is just calling foo and then bar, passing an argument. Nothing fancy, right? So we build this this way. I guess today you should say C17 because it's a thing. Um, and now we get a binary. So when you get a binary, you run it the first time, it says hello x ray, and we captured one because that's what we asked it to do. But it didn't actually get an x ray trace. And so, because this is a command line tool, we can't do the runtime, hey, do a thing, and then, hey, stop doing it. Um, so we, we have environment variables. That's one way of getting the configuration in. So you run it with the patch pre-main true, and then you run hello x-ray, and it tells you where the log is afterwards. Actually, it's the first thing, all right? So now we have a log file. And if we pass this log, through to a tool called stack. It will show us all the stacks that we've gathered in this trace. So it looks like main called foo once, and that's the number of cycles that it took, right? And then the second one is main called bar, and that's the number of cycles, yeah? Not very impressive, but there's more. All right, so we can account and figure out where the time went. And this one says, well, foo was called once, right? The minimum was 36 microseconds. Yeah, you know, printing hello x-ray takes 36 microseconds. Why are you surprised? Um, and bar took 12 microseconds. And, and main took 50 microseconds in total. Yeah? So this aggregates across all the function call traces it saw in that little trace, right? You can turn it into a graph using dot, and so now you can visualize that main called bar and main called foo, and foo is slightly darker and more red than the other one, and so more of the time went there. So this is just standard dot. You can use your, your dot viewer or whatever, and the tool actually generates the dot, and you can format and do what you want with the dot. I like saying dot a lot. All right, um, now there's a thing called flame graphs and Brendan Gregg has open sourced an implementation of generating flame graphs and nice flame graphs. So one day I was a little bored, not preparing slides, um, and I built a Clang and LVM binary with X-ray instrumentation. And I said, okay, well instrument only functions that have 75 or more or sorry, functions that have 75 or more instructions, and then get me an x-ray trace, right? And what would it look like if I had a flame graph tool? So I did that, and I'm going to switch to the demo. Now you wanna wish me luck. Oh, it's a thing. Hey, so this is 
uh, the execution trace, that's a really deep call stack. If you can help it, don't do that in your program. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not picking on Clang, I'm just saying, don't, don't, that's not good. Um, and, it, and these are actual functions. If I, if I hover over this, this is the, it's an instantiate class template specialization, yada, yada. So, right, it's a really deep call stack and let's not focus on that too much. All right, so this is, this is execute CC1 tool. Actually, let's begin this, I guess. No, no, hey, it's a thing. All right, oh, wait, no, stop. <laughs> all right, so it called the CC1 main for Clang and all the time, of course, will be accounted to that. But then we can start digging in and most of the things that are happening, oh, I, sorry, I forgot to tell you, I was just compiling Hello World with you know, stud C out, left shift, the, the, you know, the things you see in books, and we ran it with Clang, and yeah, it was uh, parsing templates. And if we focus on that, yep, all the things it was doing was these. And is that the, yes, that's a really deep call style. Let's not, look away, all right. <laughs> So, this is one of the things you can, you can come up with with the LVM X-Ray implementation today. So you can build your stuff if you're running on Linux x86. That's the most supported platform currently. And you can, you can generate this for your own applications and then see what comes out. Maybe you have really, really, okay, I'm gonna stop picking on Clang now. Um, so yeah, so that's one demo. All right. The other demo that I want to show is, say you're, you're in an environment that you know, isn't actual machines. So if this fails spectacularly, I'm like, I applaud, apologize in advance. I set this up last night. But this is the Google Cloud Platform uh, console. So if you haven't seen this before, go give it a try. But um, let's say I go to my compute engine Actually have Wi-Fi, yes, come on. Right, so the, this demo that I'm gonna show or attempt to show is if, for example, you have no access to RDTSCP because you're in a secured or you know, hampered um, guest environment in some hypervisor, and if I refresh, will it work? Oh, come on, Wi-Fi. Is that the right one? Uh, this one. Yeah. All right, let's do that. Oh, come on. <laughs> captive, yes, we're, we're trying to do the captive portal thing. Nope. Uh, yeah? No? <sighs> All right, well, I guess I'm not gonna demo that. <laughs> Boo. But if you want to see it in action, I can, I can do it later. This is why you don't do. I, I, tr I tried. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have learned from the best. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so the implementation, if we don't have access to RDTSCP, uses the thing available to most systems, which is clock get time. So caveat, it will, it will introduce some overhead. It might be in the order of, oh, half a microsecond, but you know, like if you wanted to measure stuff with really precise um, timestamp counters, run it on an actual machine, or at least have access to RDTSCP. Yeah? Okay. All right, so for the devs, how am I doing a time? Yeah, 10 minutes, yeah? 20, ooh, got time. All right. So X-Ray and LLVM has a few parts. We have an instrumentation pass and we, ha we, we have an implementation in the code generation part of it. And that's how we can tell where to put the sleds, right? And it also, and, and the analysis tools and libraries live in the LLVM repository. So in Clang, we have the options like the dash F X-Ray instrument. We haven't quite implemented that in the other front ends because we're not sure yet how to do it properly or like how to implement the x-ray runtime there but 
patches are welcome. Uh, Built-in support for, uh, there's a custom event function. It's a, it's a Clang built-in, so if you call this function in your code and you're not building with X-Ray, it basically disappears, right? Which is what you want for your instrumentation. So if, you don't, if you're not using it, it just, it's not there. Um, so this allows you to do things like, I want to write my RPC ID somewhere because I started processing a request. And then at the end, you want to write an event that says, well, I'm done processing a request at this point. So you can now start building tooling. You can start building tools around this information using the libraries that are in LLVM for analyzing the traces, right? So the source level attributes are also implemented in Clang. Talk to me if you want to implement this in your favorite front end. And X-Ray and Compiler RT, we talked about the things that actually patch and unpatch, as well as do the logging. So the version I showed you was the version that it, we call it the basic mode or naive mode. It will always write when something's happening all the time, even if it's within nanoseconds of each other. Sometimes you actually don't want that or need that, but sometimes you do. So uh, the flight data recorder mode is the mode that's more interesting if you have a long running application say a microservice or an actual service or an HTTP based service or even, even something that say runs on the desktop and you want to get timing information for stuff that's happening. And you want to control when you're starting the tracing and when you're ending. We call that flight data recorder mode. We're not, we promise to try and not crash your stuff because that's where usually flight data recorders work. But we call it FDR mode. Um, and you can, you can turn it on and off, and the documentation shows you how to do that, yeah? So support matrix, all right. We can use the normal event, no argument logging in all the platforms. Of course, this is still Linux, right? So if you wanna make this work with Mac OS or Windows, please, 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 patches are welcome. Um, I'm happy to review those patches too. So arg1 logging, basic mode, all available in all the platforms. Custom events and flight data recorder mode is still currently x86-64 only. If you want this in ARM, let's talk and let's make it happen. And if you want it in your platform that say doesn't, that can't handle like large buffers and or dynamic allocation, that's an interesting case. And we're happy to, happy to work with you to make that happen. All right, so I mentioned some of the things you can expect next. But what we're really interested in, more analysis tools. So it's one thing to get traces with m using a moderate overhead runtime, but it's another to be able to analyze the traces automatically. So one of the things I showed was the, was the, uh, the flame graph thing. The other things we're exploring are if we can visualize the execution trace using, say, the Chrome trace viewer or some other trace viewing mechanism. If you know the format or if you have tools that you want to open source, right? If you're one of these companies that work on performance debugging tools and you want to ingest X-ray traces, that's a good thing too. But uh, we also want to support more, actually this is a little outdated. We have support for two exit types. One is the normal exit and the other one is a tail exit. So because we're in the compiler, and we know when a tail exit is happening, we can instrument that properly. We also expose that in the runtime so that we know when it's a tail exit and when it's not a tail exit. The only difference between the tail exit and the non-tail exit is one is a tail, I don't know. <laughs> no, so one of them is an actual jump across to the thing you're calling instead of calling it and then returning yourself. That's a good optimization for systems and you don't want to turn that off and X-Ray doesn't need to turn that off to get the exit event, even on tail exits. So exceptional exits, so in Windows, exceptions are a thing and we currently don't handle them. If, if we can get around that somehow and have an implementation that works well with exceptions, that would be great. Um, and maybe, maybe we might be able to do something with interrupt handlers 
Um, that's going to be really interesting and beyond the scope of my experience. But <laughs> if, if you know how to do that, it would be great. And then, of course, more architectures and platforms. So this work is done by a lot of people at Google. I'm just the person that is willing to travel and talk about it. And you know, it's, it's a collaboration not just with Googlers, but also people in the LVM community and you know, from different companies that work on different systems. So for example, the ARM implementation wasn't done by me. It was done by someone in the community who wanted this in ARM 7, 8, and ARC 64. So sent patches and other people reviewed it and it happened. Same went for MIPS and some one day it's like, hey, we work on MIPS. Can we make this happen? Are you able, open to patches? And then, yeah. It's like, yep, looks good. So that's how we get the features. All right, and with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. All right, I guess we have five. Sorry? 25 minutes, oh my goodness, wow. Feels like time is really like slow up here. <laughs> or something, like just fast. I should be using x-ray to debug. So, questions, yes sir? Recursive calls, yes. It will look like you entered the function and entered the same function and entered this until you exited all of them. But um, there are cases, for example, where the recursion only happens with enters and when the exit happens, it's not actually the exit of the recursive function but the exit of the calling function. So sibling call optimizations and stuff like that. The tools are able to handle those situations. So, yes, yes. Ah. Yeah, the right. The question is, does it support shared libraries, yeah. dynamic libraries? Currently, no. There is someone actively working on making that happen. And in the next few weeks or months, we might have an implementation that does. Yes, sir. Right, so the question is, why are we patching the call in at runtime instead of leaving the call there? To be honest, we haven't tried it yet. That's, <laughs> that's the only reason. But there are some legitimate reasons why we don't want to do that because sometimes when you leave a call there, it might cause a, an indirect function call. So it might call through the uh, PLT, right? The pro uh, program linkage table. I think a procedure linkage table. And so that's a runtime lookup. And it's not the same as the spelling for calling just the 32-bit relative address. And so that's the technical reason why we're doing it the way we're doing it. But there is no technical reason why we shouldn't try leaving the call there instead. Um, we haven't run the experiments yet. But one of the things that might be an issue with if we have the call there is when the decoder, like the, the pipeline decoder, looks at this and it sees the call, it might need to do a bit more work, try and predict stuff, even if there's a jump across it. So we haven't measured that quite yet, but it's one of the concerns we have with putting non-nops in the instrumentation point. So you're right, it's not a, it's not a sled. So did, we, did I repeat the question? Yes, I, I think I did, yes. Yes, sir. Ooh, ah, that's a good question. So the question is, what happens when you try to instrument coroutines? To be honest, I haven't tried yet, but knowing how the coroutines are implemented in the LVM, they look like normal functions. Now, we don't have explicit support yet for whether or not your exit is an await or a resume or whatever, but it's certainly an interesting thing to try. And if you do and it works, I am happy for you. Please let me know. If it doesn't work, please let me know. And <laughs> maybe we should fix it. Yeah? Yes, sir. Thank you. What, what is your replacement on saying, like there's system calls or some other thing where you don't call modify the header and that's the end of it? Right. So the question is, what if you want to instrument a call to a syscall or to an external function that you don't have the definition of and can't recompile? There's, there's been 
suggestions of having instrumentation points before and after certain syscalls, which might give you some good indication, but the risk with that is um, there is the bloat question, so we will have more instrumentation points. And then we need to figure out like how to remember which, which sleds were for function calls and which sleds were for entry and exit events and handle that differently. So, it's, so the answer to that is we haven't implemented that feature yet. It's certainly a good idea. So if you have a white list of syscalls that might cause your system to block obvious things like read or write or few text stuff, right? Should be able to do something about this, but um, yeah, currently we don't have special handling for that yet. But it is a good idea, so thank you. All right, more questions? Yes, sir. Right, so the question is, have we considered not, uh, have we considered an implementation where we're not logging so much data? The answer to that is yes, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of suggestions around the same idea, which is, for example, if you wanted to get PMU count, like performance data, like cache hits and misses, and you get it at the start, and at the end of a function you get the delta, or you get the state and do some math, and record that information, yes. It's certainly doable. And the, the facilities are there um, in X-Ray for you to plug in whatever you want as a, as a handler, right? And so if you didn't want the TSC logging, you can certainly turn that off and install your own handlers. No, no questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is um, sub-function sub level instrumentation. Yeah. It's certainly an interesting thought. And there are implications for things like profile guided optimization where you want to be able to collect block level things. We haven't implemented that yet because there, 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 there's a number of intricacies in how do you, how do you preserve information <coughs> and like this is like Toolchain land and Chandler and his team know more about this, but certainly, certainly doable. Nobody's told me it's impossible. So at least you know, like the last time this happened, <laughs> it became a thing, right? So, you know, maybe maybe get more, more nods and winks from people, I guess. But it, it's, it's possible. The custom event mechanism shows you a way of doing it. So we lower into like a weird sled, which doesn't involve knobs actually. So the, the custom event sleds have an actual call in there. And because we need that call to be resolved by the linker for us. And so there are certainly ways to do this. Now we should talk offline about how exactly we're going to do this in LVM. But I like this idea. Yes, sir. Right. So the question is, is there an estimate for the overhead in terms of binary size when you turn X-ray on? So we can do a little math, right? So we have 11 bytes for an entry, 11 bytes for an exit, so that's 22 minimum. And then we have two entries in the instrumentation map that are 32 bit, or sorry, 32 bytes, so 64 in total. So 64 plus 22 is, I suck at math, but that's per function. So if you have enough functions, you can, this, these start to add up. And so we've seen cases where like we get the map plus the, the instrumentation sleds to around 300 megs for one of the bigger binaries we saw. But that's like 1% of the, the whole thing or like something within, yeah, it's, it's not the whole binary just suddenly became 3x, right? So 
But if you spell the flags correctly, you can get all your functions. And then, uh, so you can control the, num the heuristic, the, the threshold we use to determine whether or not to instrument a function. And so the default is 200 instructions, so that, that eliminates a lot of functions. But if you went lower to say, oh, I don't know, one, and that gets everything. And so obviously the, the trade-off will be different. But sometimes, if you do actually want the whole execution trace for all the functions for your execution because, I don't know, reasons, go for it, right? Yeah. But it is measurable, and you, you, can, start, you can start tweaking that for your builds anyway. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> right, so I can't repeat all that, <laughs> but <laughs> my memory buffers aren't large enough. But I think the concern is um, some of the stuff that's left behind by the instrumentation might be exploitable. Yeah. And I am not a security engineer. I just I just work on this. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that like this is already linked into your binary. And this is part of your process, and we're not trying to do this from outside like a debugger would, or like some other tracing mechanism would that, that the kernel has power to do this. So because this is part of your binary, this is definitely a risk you want to either mitigate proactively or analyze with your security team and see if, you know, if the risks are kind of worth it because, well, we're not exposing stuff to the network or, you know, uh, because the way you might exploit this might be you find the bug somewhere first and then, oh, wh wow, we have an instrumentation map for X-ray. This is great, right? At that point, that other vector is more important. Um, so, yeah, so this, there's certainly some security discussion that has to happen around this especially if you're deploying it in, 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 in production or into, into environments where you have sensitive material that might be, you know, exfiltrated if you're not careful. TLDR, but talk to your security engineer. Yes, so y thank you. The TLDR is talk to your security engineer and, like, make sure they're happy. <laughs> thank you for that question, yes. Uh, yes, sir. So, question is, if you strip your binary, you lose it all? Can you just take this right and just trace? So, right, okay. Uh, when you strip your binary, there are certain sections that unless are whitelisted, will be removed. So some of the debug sections <coughs> and uh, symbols, et cetera. So if you wanted to preserve the instrumentation map, because that's a different section, you have to teach your strip mechanism to leave that alone. But the sleds are there, right? They, like, they don't get stripped out because they're already part of your function. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Yes? Um, so slightly related, could you then load the instrumentation map at runtime and avoid the majority of the slide choice? Because it's so 64 bytes of right. for the instrumentation map, but only 22 for the actual sleds. 
So the question is, can we just load the instrumentation map from a file at runtime and then do the thing? That's a tad less secure than having it actually in your binary. So we could certainly do that, but we don't. Because a malicious mechanism might install an in instrumentation map that will cause your binary to just get owned. So let's not do that. Um, but then again, I'm not a security engineer. Maybe that's an acceptable use case. And you know, it's, it's n so the technical reason why we're not doing it is because we haven't implemented it. And we're reluctant to implement it because it seems like it's just too easy to get wrong. So, yes? Ah, that was the thing I was going to demo. So the question was, does the attribute actually stop inlining? And the short answer to that is no. And the long answer to that is no, it does not. <laughs> because, OK, so the actual reason is because the, the x-ray instrumentation pass works way, way later than all the, uh, all the optimizations. And this is at the point where we're turning the in-memory representation of a memory of a machine function in LVM into assembler slash native code. And so like at, at that, if, if all the optimizations have already happened, we're only seeing the functions that actually get lowered and need to be instrumented. So we don't prohibit, like we do not inhibit inlining. And this is a distinct, um, feature of X-ray compared to the other ways of doing um, uh, instrumenta instrumented builds, which insert actual function calls high up in the stack and inhibit a lot of the optimizations that would have happened otherwise. So thank you for asking that question. I think, like, the cloud demo thing sh would have showed this clearly, where we have a trace of a thing built with dash 03 in X-ray and a thing that was built with dash O zero. And so, and one of the functions disappeared because it's been inlined into main. But yeah, so you try it for yourself. But yes, the answer is it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with inlining. Yes, sir. Is there any uh, special handling for um, AP process that's scheduled out in terms of the um, timing? Right, so the question is, is there a special handling for when your pro like thread or process gets descheduled? The answer to that is no. So we, we kind of haven't figured out a way for the kernel to tell us <laughs> that, hey, you've been descheduled now, and here's like a thing you can run when, no. So not yet, unfortunately. Or uh, maybe not ever. But, um, but your um, timing takes account of it. Yes, yeah, so yes, the timing does take account for it. So for some, sometimes you might find a call stack, and then suddenly, for some reason, in this function, it took like microseconds. And you can start reasoning about how that happened, why that happened, but we can't tell you it's because you know, you've been descheduled. So you wanna, you wanna be able to correlate this data that you're getting with X-ray with other data sources. So for example, you can get kernel traces as well for the same period of time you're tracing. And then try and figure out, oh, okay, thread number blah was actually descheduled at this point. So there are kernel tracing uh, mechanisms that you can use. Like there are myriad of them. Yeah. So, but yeah. Cool. No questions. For, uh, can I ask questions? <laughs> no. Thank you very much, guys and ladies. And you know, um, talk to me afterwards if you have more questions and if you'd like to see that demo. Let's let's do it. <laughs> All right. Cheers. <laughs>